Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. Hair relaxer docket leaders Deandra Fu Zimmerman and LaRuby Mang discuss the basic claims of MDL 3060, the discriminatory marketing and the importance of having diversity on council when fighting for women of color poisoned by hair relaxers. Uh, good morning, ladies. So happy to have you here on Legal Cast. Uh, LaRuby, it's your first time that I'm sitting with you to interview. Uh, how is everything going for you? Uh, things are going well. Super grateful, very thankful, uh, very blessed uh, here in the, the nation's capital where the weather's not too bad for me today. So uh, happy to be here. That's wonderful. And, and Fu, I know you've been traveling. Uh, how are you doing today? Good. Good. Um, in one piece, got off the plane. So that's always a win. That That is a huge win. That's a huge win. Uh, well, the two of you really are something special and unique. You've recently been appointed to leadership in the hair relaxer uh, litigation. Uh, tell me what that's like and, and what the path to leadership looked like for each of you, LaRuby. Um, well, you know, so, I, you know, my path to leadership has really been one that I've been very grateful and thankful to follow the leadership of Fu. Um, I, I think, you know, I, at every opportunity I get to tell people, I, I'm so grateful to be uh, in this season of my legal career while Fu is in this season of her legal career and, you know, breaking barriers for, for Black women. And so it's pretty exciting for me, for actually pretty exciting, not only to be on that, but even to be on this podcast uh, with her. Um, and it's just been a journey. I mean, like, you know, my journey into the mass tort world <clears throat> has been somewhat non-traditional and kind of pretty aggressive. And, uh, you know, so obviously, you know, you know, currently again with Fu, get the privilege of sitting on the on the Paraquat MDL. I think I'm just like I'm following her everywhere. So she kind of no. she kind of can't <laughs> get rid of me. <laughs> they can't get rid I don't of me know that she time. wants to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, you know, everybody but your mama gets tired of you, believe me. <laughs> so, uh, so, but, um, you know, so, you know, having the opportunity to, 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 to have my first leadership on Paraquad. And then obviously when, when Hair Relaxer came out, um, not just when the MDL came out, but when uh, Fu and others were already looking at it and allowed me the opportunity to start being a part of, of getting prepared for an MDL was when it's, you know, when my journey for Hair Relaxer started. And I guess maybe, even to be more honest, my journey into the hair relaxer litigation started when I was a kid begging my mom to let me get a hair relaxer um, and, to, you know, to, to all those issues that come along with wanting to have your hair straight or those things. And so I think it really probably started then. And, and now this is just, you know, the next stage and the opportunity to be a part of something that you're already a part of, thankfully. It uh, hasn't resulted in me having a cancer, um, but it definitely is still my journey is a part of the experience that many black women across this country have experienced. And uh, like I said, it's allowed me to now join. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I think Fu is quoted as saying is like one of the most diverse uh, MDL leaderships in the history. And, and to be a part of that is, again, um, you know, beyond the imagination of a, of, of a lawyer, you know, that's from Pensacola, Florida uh, in this journey. So. That's wonderful. And uh, it's it's quite outstanding that all six founders of Shades of Mass are were appointed to leadership. Uh, Fu, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Well, first of all, Ruby never gives herself credit. She's a great lawyer. She's become a very close friend to me. And, and I was lucky enough to meet her in Paraquat. And We've, we've worked together, we're working together in Hair Relaxer, and we're going to work together on many things together. And uh, LaRuby's an amazing lawyer. She is she is um, co-founder of her own law firm. So she is one of the few, you know, Black women, her partner is a woman of color, leading, you know, a major plaintiff contender in the country. And I think that's really tremendous, actually. Um, and we've, we've worked for months together leading up to the JPML petition. So it's been really exciting for me to, to learn and, and work with LaRuby. And, and even before being a lawyer, LaRuby was a tremendous advocate of people of color, disenfranchised people, all people who are impacted. So she is the perfect person um, to be at the front of leadership in the complex litigation world at this time. And I'm so excited to work with her um so <laughs> yeah so, no problem so shades of mass it's it's exciting um you know that i think shades of mass was the culmination of 
a, a lot of discussion over decades and specifically among black and brown lawyers, but also the larger legal community about, you know, opening those pathways. Um, I think that what this proves, you know, is that there have been qualified black and brown and Asian and other people of color who could have participated in leadership in these cases of national significance. And we're, we're seeing um, all of these really gifted lawyers being pushed to the forefront, helping to lead these, these litigations with some of the firms who are exceptional, who have done it for a long time, who also have a lot of experience and really making sure that we have a truly diverse a team leading these cases. So yeah, I, I think um, for all of us, uh, all of the board of Shades of Mass, it's the realization of a lifetime dream um, to be able to sit in these, these types of cases in a leadership capacity and help shape the future of the litigation. So it's, uh, I think it's a year after Shades of Mass founding, uh, had a great conference, have a conference uh, that's coming to everybody on September 21st. We've had many appointments of people of color. Marlon Kimson, uh, who's now on the board, is, is co-lead um, of the Black Bod and just Navans on this leadership slate and Larry and, and you name it. We have a, a lot of people. So, um, you know, we're, we're real plaintiff lawyers. We like to see a result to our efforts. And so I, I think we've been seeing um, some pretty amazing results with Shades of Maps. You certainly have. And, and the last time that we sat down, uh, we talked about, you know, you were the first African-American woman appointed to leadership on the plaintiff side in an MDL. And you talked about that experience. It, clearly, you're, you're opening doors for many others that will follow you. I think, I mean, this happened between the last time and now that, that wasn't that long. And what a tremendous uh, accomplishment um, and, and how significant it is. It's not, um, and I know, LaRuby, you've talked about this when you've been interviewed before, but filling those quotas or, um, you know, having, like, being the token person of color on a panel or in a meeting, this is not that anymore. It seems that we've broken through um, quite a bit. Do you agree or disagree or, or have any feelings about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, you know Shade to Mass and the work that we're doing hasn't eliminated tokenism. Like that's still going to be a part of the reality that that we face, right? As as women and as sure. definitely as Black women. But I think we've made progress, and the progress, as Fu has made, has said, you know, just even the efforts of Shades of Mass within a year, the progress that we've made to show that, you know, to to show what's already there. So it's not like we went out and we created great lawyers, great plaintiffs lawyers, great trial lawyers. We were already here. We were already there. This was just about opening the doors and letting other people not only see that that we're here, but that um, but that we bring an added value to the team that's been shut out uh, for so many years and, and for so so many decades. And I think that yeah. you know we have to continue. That the fight's not over. It is amazing in one perspective to say that that Fu is the first black woman to lead. Uh, to co-lead on the plaintiff side for an MDL, but, you know, I'll let her speak for herself, but that's not enough, right? Like it's going to be, you know, to have more. And, and I think that, you know, for, for me and my firm, you know, we're the only black and brown woman owned firm uh, in the country that that's on multiple MDLs. And whereas we're thankful for that and we're excited for that, but that's not enough for us. We want more black and brown owned firm and more black and brown women owned firm to be able to have opportunities. And so, you know, I, I, I recognize at least, and I think those of us in Shades of Mass also recognize like too much is given, much is required. And so we've been given great opportunities um, and that those opportunities means that we have to continue to create more opportunities for the next generation, uh, even current generation, but definitely for future generation of black and brown lawyers in the mass tort world. Yeah. Uh, Fu, do you have thoughts on that? Yes, I think it's everything LaRuby said. I don't I don't think it's um, opening doors. You know, I think it's a continuation of a lot of work. Um, I, I read an article recently that, you know, now we're facing significant layoffs. We're in an inflation. We're having challenges. And there's been a significant cut to a lot of the DIE positions that have been created in corporations and in public institutions. Um, in, in the wake of George Floyd and, and Ben and Tony's work, um, as I sit in, Minia in Minneapolis, I, ironically. Um, and I think what that speaks to, which LaRuby touched on, is having a big push, having progress, and then everybody going, all right, there you go. 
Um, and I think it's a more complicated issue about understanding the real value of all Americans, everybody on this soil, you know, in, in, in parity that um, the same way people intuitively uh, might see an older white male walk in a room in, in a courtroom and believe that is the lead lawyer or believe that is the expert or believe that's the person who does expert work. Our goal, which I don't think I'll see in my lifetime, is for LaRuby or myself or Larry or an Avan to walk into a courtroom and people make those same assumptions overall. And that's not the reality. Um, the, the, the response to us now is one from people just knowing who we are over time. Um, and, and so Ruby's point is well taken. You know, it is, it is part of changing our culture um, as a country slowly, and it takes efforts by everybody. So for us, one of our ways of contributing was addressing the dearth of black and brown and other lawyers of color uh, in positions of leadership in the plaintiff bar, in MDLs, and ultimately in complex work. And we're just going to keep pushing that ball. Um, I think part of that is being in the cases, leading the cases, doing the work, and and really unearthing these views that people have um, about Black capacity and Black intelligence and ability to really compete uh, in this in this realm. Yeah, and, and certainly I didn't mean to... Uh to convey that I thought the, the fight was over or, you know, you won and that's it at all. There's certainly a lot, a lot more to be done. Um, curious, Fu, uh, what your thoughts are. So the hair relaxer litigation, um, you know, we know that it, it affects more uh, black and brown women uh, or people of color than um, say not. What is the tie between, like, what's the import and value add to have people of color leading that litigation on the plaintiff side? Um, it, is there, you know, the connection between attorney and client? Um, you know, what are your, your thoughts that? I mean, I have my own, but but I definitely don't want to hear myself talk about this. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think it's the same thing when you have a, a, a case involving women's products or women's health issues and only men are leading, right? This is about inclusion and not exclusion. So, of course, there are of folks in our bar who are not of color who are leading. But in terms of our own knowledge, just across the board, these are products used in our communities. As, as you heard, LaRuby used the product since she was a child. Uh, so many people really had no idea what a relaxer was, <laughs> including some of the lawyers who are amazing lawyers who are involved in the litigation. And so you have lawyers who have a personal, a personal stake, not primarily actual factual knowledge about the products, the evolution of the products, how the products are used, personal knowledge about the marketing and what kind of marketing's out there, what kind of commercials were out there, how people were impacted by it. You know, third, we have folks who have their family members and they have been impacted personally by this incident. And then of course you have the client lawyer relationship where clients can speak to someone who very much identifies with a lot of it, um, of, of what they've been through with the hair relaxer. And so aside from, you know, generally having diverse viewpoints, diverse backgrounds and how that contributes to building a strong litigation strategy, um, you know, those are some of the specifics, specifically in this case, why it, it's, it's perfect and appropriate um, that so much of our leadership is black and brown and, and of, of other um, cultural backgrounds. Ruby, yeah, uh, Ruby, wh what do you think? I I'm assuming you agree, but but I'd like to hear your thoughts as well. No, I, I absolutely agree. Right with uh, what I'll say is I, I co-sign on on what uh, Fu said, and, and I think that um, you know there the additional part that I would say is the the relationship with the clients. I mean, I think that. Um, hair relaxer, I mean, other litigation as well, but hair relaxers, when you're able to, to, you know, the majority of the population that we're going to, to represent are going to be black women and black women, uh, like, uh, uh, black folk generally, right. Um, have a distrust of the legal system, right. A lot of the distrust is in the criminal system, but the civil justice system hasn't done well or right by black folk either. And so when you have black lawyers that are part of 
the plaintiff's bar in, in representing that connection for folks and them understanding and trusting that the folks at the table are going to be litigating. The folks at the table, the lawyers at the table are going to be fighting for me because they look like me, because they have a shared experience as I have. And again, that's, you know, that's not to discount our brothers and sisters that are, that'll be on, that are on the team with us that don't have that shared experience, but that's, it, it's not about them. Right. It is about the plaintiffs right. that we will be privileged to serve and about their experience and about how they're coming to this experience and, and to the table and being represented. And I think that, um, you know, it just matters, you know, whether or not it's because uh, the plaintiffs see lawyers that look like them um, or whether or not it's, it's, it's little girls and uh, young ladies in law school that see folks like Fu and myself uh, litigating, litigating at this table. Um, I, you know, I think one of the best examples is I believe the young lady's name is Lucretia uh, Afu, who, who came to, you know, want to be a part of this litigation just because it was personal, just because she's a black woman, just because she's a lawyer. And so what I think the impacts that we'll see not only will be significant in terms of the women we're privileged to represent, but it'll also, you know, have a, a tremendous impact on young black women lawyers across this country and letting them know that like, hey, you know, it matters that you're at the table. It matters that you represent uh, folks uh, uh, that look like you. And so, it, again, it's a pretty exciting time, um, again, to be in this season of my career um, uh, while we're doing hair relaxer. And I think it's also important that hair relaxer is predominantly black, right? It's predominantly black women, but almost every mass tort that's out there and all the ones that will come will have a disproportionate or disparate impact on black and brown communities. And so, you know, making sure that folks around the table represent that interest will be important. It's so profound, really. And I'm, and I'm really glad that you raised the point about, uh, you know, people looking up and seeing you two in leadership, right? Uh, whether it's Black women in law school or young girls. Um, and uh, it made me think, I just read uh, Viola Davis's memoir, and she was talking about going through acting school and how uh, there were no uh, actors of color that they were supposed to emulate while in class. And, and so, something that I'd never thought about. Um, you know, I'm, I had looked up and, you know, other than, you know, being Jewish and not necessarily seeing Jews everywhere, I, I, the people looked like me. And so there's such an import. Um, it, it's so critical that these plaintiffs see people who look like them and they feel heard. And so much, there's so much focus on, you know, whether it's mass toward advertising or, uh, you know, otherwise just, you know, going and getting clients and, and being on leadership. And there's a bad reputation sometimes of plaintiff's lawyers, but, but really um, it, it seems you two are trying to make sure your clients are heard. And, and now the world knows um, and, and you can speak for them. Um, what about um, LaRuby? You've said, um, and I, and I took this quote from a, another podcast that you were interviewed on. You said the greatest privilege in this life is to serve. I agree with that completely. It's something that I've said, um, you know, for a long time. But what does that mean to you to be where you are right now? Uh, yeah, a friend of mine told me that before. And he said, hey, Ruby, the greatest privilege in life is to serve. And he said, but most people want to serve. He said, the difference is you have the resources to serve. And so I think that now, again, uh, uh, you know, in this litigation, we have the resources. We have brilliant leaders like... Fu and, and, and Ben and, and Fidelma and Michael that are leading our team. Uh, we have the financial resources to kind of go at, at this. And so, you know, we do this all the time, right? As lawyers, like we get a chance to serve the needs of our clients. And again, the more personal it is, I think the, um, the more passion kind of comes into it. But, um, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is a great privilege to serve. I am privileged to serve. And now, um, I, you know, I'm privileged to serve with a, with a great group of lawyers that are all fighting for the common benefit of Black women. And, and Fu, um, what about your thoughts on that? And um, and also, I'll add, I'll throw in. Uh, you know, you mentioned the fight's not over. What's the next step? Where where do you where do you see? You know, maybe let's say the next shade of mass after this one. You know, where would you like to see us um, and and the plaintiff lawyer community? Sure. So I, I think the first thing, like what Ruby said, is we are all really lucky people. You know, we get to sit here and, and talk about these issues and participate in changing these issues. I'm a black woman, but my parents are immigrants, you know. And so I think growing up in New York City with immigrants, seeing 
on having a real understanding of what the rest of the world goes through and what black and brown and poor white folks in this country go through is a very different perspective. So I think definitely in La Ruby, there is no hubris. You know, it's for us, it's um, we're lucky to be here. Uh, we've been given an opportunity, a, flat, a platform and resources. And for me, uh, because of my upbringing, you know, as a Catholic with immigrant parents, it would be immoral from my upbringing to not use that, to not be a voice, um, to not participate in making things better. Also for a very selfish reason. I, I have two daughters, a 14 year old and an eight year old. And for me, I would like for them to see a world with much less of the violence and loss and disappointment than we have, which I, I'm failing right now. But, you know, as plaintiff lawyers, we're in a very unique space. You know, I'm, I'm failing. I mean, I think we're on the brink of war right now. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're in a unique space. You know, plaintiff lawyers are very special people. And I think that um, since the 80s, there's been big corporate propaganda to frame us all as greedy. And uh, most plaintiff lawyers I know like the fight. You know, and they want to hold companies accountable. They want to hold people accountable. And we want to do the same thing. And we have a very unique perspective from our backgrounds because it is very personal. Uh, you know, I yeah. think even to this day, we know what it is to be treated like nothing. We know what it is to be dismissed. And while some people run away from that and say, oh, I'm a lawyer now, or I'm important now, or I have financial resources now, that's a choice. That's a choice that Ruby and I decided not to make, to remember what it is like to be treated like nothing. So I think that, um, you know, that informs what I believe is an obligation on behalf of people who have resources to try to make life a little better uh, for the people around us, because life can be really, really hard. And so that's, I think, you know, what motivates me. Number one, my children, as everybody knows, I'm obsessed with them every day. And number two, that, you know, we've we've moved this half an inch. And I say half an inch because you just think about so many people. Um, you know, you talk about being Jewish, have tons of family in Europe, everything that happened during the war. You know, it's so easy to slip back. It's so easy for like the evil forces of Mordor to do really evil things and fight justice. So we're yeah. just trying to like move that half an inch <laughs> and hold the line. You know, that's what we're trying. We're trying to move things forward at the same time we're trying to hold the line. So we're not kind of pulled backwards. Um, and as for Shades of Mass, you know, we as a board are working on our collective vision. Uh, like, like many exciting things, Shades of Mass isn't mine or Ben's or LaRuby's. It's kind of taken on a life of its own. <laughs> we get dozens of calls and texts and emails about people who want to participate, people who want to contribute. Uh, the board is in the process um, with Marlon Kimson from Motley Rice leading the helm on, on developing our membership process. Um, it was rather close as we tried to build it and made sure it had enough strength and momentum. And since we founded it, we've had an article published in Westlaw on diversity with guidelines, um, you know, to the extent judges and others are interested in taking a look. We've had the conference, we've, had, we've, we've done quite a bit um, in a year. And so the next chapter is to collectively decide on what that membership looks like. Uh, Nay Van Ward is leading a um, webinar that we will have in short order on the hair relaxer litigation. We're getting the conference ready. We hope to have another publication out uh, and we hope to be a resource training ground, collaborative ground for other lawyers who feel that uh, they should be in the ring. You know, they should be a part of this great process. So uh, we got lots of plans. LaRuby, what are our other plans for Shades of Mass and all our spare time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all um, the spare time. To, 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 to create the pipeline. Right. I mean, you know, in addition to all of that and all the other things that, you know, making sure that we provide because, you know, they're, 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 they're touch points into the mass tort world. And even because you have a touch doesn't mean that you get an opportunity. Right. You can serve on an, you know, you can get on an LDC or, or a, an MDL and never get any work, never get any assignments, never get a chance to build your capacity. And so working with our, our HBCU law schools, working with BALSA chapters uh, across the country, I think is, is, is going to be a part of what you will see next in the evolution or in the in the life of Shades of Mass. As we, again, as we said, this is, this is our season to be where we are in this moment. 
but it's not, uh, uh, this is not the moment, right? The moment is beyond us. It su supersedes us. It will be when Fu's daughters are lawyers or when my niece and, you know, are lawyers. And so making sure that we have a pipeline because, you know, it becomes important that, that the next generation of black and brown lawyers don't have the same fights that we have. Like they're going to have to fight. Right. And we're going to prepare them to be fighters, to be warriors. Right. But, right. you know, we want them to fight the, the, the next fight and not the fight that we're fighting. And in order to do that, you know, we, we got to make sure that we're clearing the path for them and, you know, turning all the lights on that we can so that that their vision is, is better because it's brighter for them to see. And I'll say yeah, one I, of my fantasies. I love that, is, by the way. Uh, to, just turning the lights on. Yeah. It's just great. I love that. Now, I was going to say, Go through ahead, Shades yeah. of Mass, I think LaRuby La spot on to create these, to help support great lawyers that are already out there and, and help create and develop great lawyers. And I, I just said for, for, for me, even at the Cello Levitt, that that also spans focus, of course, on diversity, but spans race to the extent that we want to unleash lawyers that will carry the helm. And, you know, I remember 15 years ago, people laughing about global warming. Now everybody's running and the lawyers that file that case, people laughed. Um, and we talked about issues with AI and issues with face recognition and privacy. And now we're in the battle of our lives. You know, a lot of my partners, Amy Keller and David Strait to preserve our privacy information. So what we're talking about, and it's, it's not being overly dramatic, is our identity and our survival. And it's necessary to have plaintiff lawyers who are believers, who are diverse, and who are well-trained, who are well-supported, who are well-resourced uh, to continue holding the line for us. And that's what this is about. It, it's uh, the things that you're saying are really just so wonderful and, and also, frankly, really inspiring. Um, one of the things that I, that I think about a lot is... Um, in the Southern District of Florida, Judge Rudy Ruiz, who was appointed, um, you know, fairly recently, um, young Cuban, you know, has a young family, two kids. Uh, he started a practice on his own uh, that uh, the court doesn't allow uh, arguments on motions, right? They, they normally would decide it on the briefs, but allows the opportunity for partners at law firms to uh, have associates of color um, or others, you know, women, uh, minorities who otherwise wouldn't have had an opportunity to speak in court to argue those motions if both sides agree and want to give that opportunity. I've always liked that, uh, you know, not creating unnecessary work. I think, you know, part of lawyering is getting thrown in and learning how to do things and being able to think on your feet and being able to fight, but you need the opportunity to fight. So I've always thought that you need opportunity, but then also you need you know, not just, let's say, people of color, not just women, we need others to be able to see and support in order to allow that to happen and to flourish. Do you, I mean, agree or disagree? Or are there other sort of programs that you've seen that we, we should be replicating throughout the country? Uh, La Ruby? Um, you know, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I, you know, let me tell you, I went to... Uh... Uh, a small college called Eckerd College, where uh, there's a thousand students and 49 of us were black, right? And and I get the privilege of going back and speaking almost, you know, every year at Eckerd. And, and I have some of my friends who went to HBCUs and others who are like, hey, you know, you're, you're in this social justice fight. You're fighting for black and brown folk. Why are you so intentional about going back to Eckerd to talk to students? And what I tell them is that, you know, the majority white student population that's there they're going to be managers and CEOs and bosses, and they're going to be running businesses across this country, right? And we need, those of us who don't look like them, need for them to, to have conversations, to be better bosses, to be better allies, to be better advocates, to be able to recognize the sensitivities that we need in every space out there, whether or not it's in the legal field, obviously that's where we are, but you know, making sure that we have allies, right? It, it, it doesn't help people of color to be the only people in the room fighting for people of color. We got to have other folks in the room, especially those folks who have access to resources fighting for us. And, and again, it's, it, you know, it's not just fighting for people of color. It's just fighting for what's fair. It's just fighting for justice. Right. And so being able to make sure that we have other justice advocates uh, and warriors fighting on the field with us um, is just as important as making sure that we're on the field fighting with them. I mean, absolutely. It's kind of like February when people say it's Black History Month. It's American history. <laughs> and and it has to be relegated to a month because we don't understand 
that we're Americans, you know, all on this soil. And to Ruby's point, it's not about, you know, helping a group. No one's helping us. These are American people, you know, and or residents or people on the soil. And so that that's a really important point in this, right? It's, it's about everybody understanding that we are supposed to be working together, living together, ethically, morally, legally, are supposed to be be provided these same opportunities, the same opportunities to compete, that it is A, the right thing to do, and B, it works. <laughs> you know, it works. It works in the schools. It works in business. It works in developing business. It's important for non-kumbaya reasons. And so I think that the judges program is a great program. Um, I think that through even this technology and texts and phones and a different world, people are losing what makes us plaintiff lawyers. And it's the ability to be persuasive. And sometimes it's in writing, but I have been in court many times where the tide has been turned by a lawyer's arguments, sometimes against me and sometimes I'm the one that turned the tide. <laughs> and I think that, you know, it's we're losing um, what makes us unique. As trial lawyers, I think almost half the presidents of the United States were lawyers. A lot of our greatest advocates are lawyers. You know, at our type of law, not, you know, I'm, we're not transactional lawyers, we're not patent lawyers, but the plaintiff lawyers are supposed to be to stand up there, sometimes with very little behind you, and advocate for your clients and learn how to do that. And so to not have that skill, um, unless you're going to be like a contained ESI person, right? But to not have that skill, I think, is going to limit your ability to compete. So I think his program is awesome. You know, LaRuby has consistently brought students um, to different legal programming and just expose them to what is an art. Being an orator, being a trial lawyer is an art. And, and I learned it, not great at it, like some of my mentors, but I learned it by watching them and listening to them in boardrooms, in courtrooms. Um, and it's something you have to see and it's something you have to participate in. You know, I was a debater in high school. So I think people kind of gloss over it like you're special and you're born into it. You actually learn that. And um, to have lawyers of color exposed to the marriage of the substance of the law and your personality and procedural issues and dealing with everybody around you and having to shift when a judge basically tells you you're dumb and that's gonna happen in your career when a judge looks at you and is like don't, don't know what to tell you you know don't know what to tell you i'm, I'm headed to an appellate circuit in uh, uh less than 19 days and that's a rough circuit i'm expecting the appellate judges Oof. to tell me i'm done but you know that's something you got to learn and it makes you competitive as a lawyer. And I think it makes you a great um, part of a team. And so I think that's, I think any program that gets young people or inexperienced lawyers in a courtroom to learn um, how to be flexible, how to adapt, how to think on your feet, how to process information is, is, is really yeah. crucial. I love, I love that, um, you know, this idea of you earn it, you work at it. Um, for some people, it comes more naturally, absolutely. But, you know, certainly being in the midst of it, uh, the one thing that, not the one thing, but one of the things that I really do miss about pre-COVID is motion calendar and going to the civil courthouse, state courthouse, it's Florida, not Florabama, but, you know, I'm, I'm much more south. We're like North Cuba, right? And just watching lawyers good and bad. And I would say more so bad lawyering <laughs> helped. And you just watch the interactions between the judges and it's, you know, the five minute motion calendar and it just goes on and on. And I remember sitting there, uh, you know, with my mouth hung open, like, I can't believe this is, this is really how it's happening. And so the more hands-on for me, at least that type of learning uh, to me has always been the most important. So all of the conferences, the workshops, the educational opportunities, the shadowing, uh, you know, just being able to shadow someone is is quite brilliant. And I, I remember all of the opportunities that I had to do that. And so I commend you both for, you know, for in your free time, <laughs> taking that on as well <laughs> and giving yeah. others the opportunity. Um, you know, yeah, free, oh, oh, free time. Free. I'm like, I have kids too. I, I, I think my free time, yeah, when I'm sleeping, maybe sometimes. <laughs> but uh, yeah. for, for a moment, I'll, I'll let's see. switch over. Say it again. Uh, listen, I just say one more thing, which is important about yeah, this, this human, human contact. 
these are not files. These are people. And um, just maybe a month ago, I got in a car with a younger lawyer who works with me and we drove, you know, an hour and 20 minutes into rural Alabama to meet with our client in a nursing home case. And so you, you're going to forget why we do what we do if you're not in the mix. You know, if you're working on a piece of a piece of a piece of a document, we have to constantly remind ourselves that we're here to protect people, to get justice for people and to hold people accountable. And, and you just can't do that if you're always in a room, on a computer, not interacting with people. I'm really glad you raised that that point. And, and for me, that's one of the joys of being able to sit and interview people, both lawyers, um, those in the legal space, and also plaintiffs uh, about what they're going through. And also, you know, I guess I'll throw it out there, but to me, that's the most... Um, that takes the most energy out of me is the human element is that, you know, sometimes I hit that point where it's, there's just, it's too much. And I have to just take a break from it because you're always told, don't make this personal, right? Don't take this personally. It's business. And, and it's not the case for victim advocacy. Um, how, how do you manage the stress uh, or the pressure, probably a better word of, of knowing that it's people's lives? Um. <laughs> When, when you when you are regardless of what your law school experience is, at least in my opinion, once you you know take that bar and you pass and you're sworn in, um, regardless of what type of law that you decide to practice, you you know you know excluding maybe representing corporations, you represent people, right? And so I've, I've never had the privilege of not thinking about the people that I'm privileged to serve as people, right? Granted, you know, a large population that, I, that I've been able to serve are black and brown folks. And so, you know, they look like me and my brothers and sisters and my mom. So that makes them people. But I think that any any lawyer, especially any personal injury or plaintiff's lawyer that represents, you know, individuals and not entities, um, if, if you're not approaching your client as a human, right, as an interest, I mean, you know, we get into this thing, I think, who kind of went to like you know, people are like campaigns and like, you know, you know, it's, it's about, a, a, a you know, how many cases you have in your portfolio, right? Like, you know, sure. folks that view it, clients that way, um, you know, I'm not going to say that they're not going to be successful in making money, but they're not going to be successful in changing lives. And for me, the opportunity and the privilege of being a lawyer, right, is it is about changing lives, right? And I get a chance to change the lives of the people I represent. And the people that I represent, they they change my life. And so for me, it, 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 there's never a time or never an opportunity that I've had to serve a, a client that I didn't view them as as a human or as a client, or as like my mama or my grandma on them, right? And, and, and making sure that that I give them the excellence that they deserve in terms of representation. And, and you know, and I don't know, you know, you know, they're, they're definitely lawyers in the past that have brought that to the table and they're lawyers that haven't. And I think, you know, the more uh, lawyers look like the, 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 the more diverse the lawyers are and the more they look like the population that they get a chance to serve. I think that that element will come more to the table in humanizing, you know, the people that, that we get a chance to serve. Yeah. There are certainly a lot of individuals I've spoken to who, who have a, uh, feelings about plaintiff's lawyers and, and the way that they've been treated, which is shocking to me. I don't know if it's just, uh, you know, someone's personality or otherwise, but certainly that human element is the crux of, um, of what being a plaintiff's lawyer is all about. Um, so we've talked about uh, the leadership of the hair relaxer litigation, the plaintiffs who's affected by this. Uh, Fu, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about uh, the science, right? What are the allegations? What's that issue? And why is this coming to light now? Sure. So uh, for decades, the defendants have made a number of products, hair relaxer products, which are meant to uh, relax the bonds in curly hair. And the chemicals in these products have evolved over time, first beginning with lye, there are formulations that have had formaldehyde. Everything you can imagine has been in these products. So there are a time, and even now, some of the products have types of chemicals called uh, endocrine disruption chemicals, but that's just one category of some of the chemicals that we understand to be problematic. Um, so there are a number of chemicals at play, and, I, and I'll talk about the studies in a moment. 
um, that ultimately impacted the health state of these women and led to some deaths. Of course, we have wrongful death cases um, in the MDL at this time and, and thousands of estates that will be represented across the country. Um, and so this had been an issue um, with regards to the, some of the categories of chemicals over time that a lot of scientists had looked into and health professionals had looked into. And in October of last year, we refer to it as the Chang study. Uh, there was a study released showing 4.1 times uh, the, it developing, uh, the risk of developing uterine cancer as a result of using hair hair relaxers four or more times per year. And a lot of that's supported by, if you think about the exposure of the individual, you know, putting those types of chemicals on your scalp, you know, on your hair for an extended amount of time, pretty consistently for a lot of people. For some people, three weeks, uh, every, you know, every three weeks, every four weeks, and I'm talking about for decades wow. for some folks. Um, there's also a white study uh, that that is strongly relied on in terms of the increased exposure, um, two times the increased exposure for ovarian cancer. And, and those are the studies that are helping to lead the charge in terms of what the main injuries are in the MDL. And they are uterine and ovarian cancer, to be clear. Um, and so aside from those two studies, um, a body of scientific work that we will advance in the litigation, um, you know, supporting our general causation theories about why these women develop ovarian and uterine cancer. Um, the first case that was filed uh, was with Ben and I on behalf of Jenny Mitchell, similar to what Lou Ruby said, began using hair relaxer as a very young um, child used it well until she was almost 30, where she developed uterine cancer and had to have a full hysterectomy. So we're talking about pretty systematic exposure, right? Um, for some folks, three weeks, yeah. four weeks, um, every month for years. Uh, we're talking about chemicals that are known to be toxic, and we're talking about a product that is known to be toxic and that is the subject of significant studies that have been released and a lot of experts that are prepared to weigh in on what the issues are. Um, the damages as we talk about ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, women with hysterectomies and everything that comes with it, including early onset of menopause, which has a host of health issues, as you could imagine, in addition to the inability sure. to biologically bear children. Um, a lot of our claims are around exactly that, the failure to warn, which they were obligated to um, it's really important as we talk about the claims and what their obligations are to understand that this isn't a drug case, it's not a medical device case, it's a cosmetics case. And there is a very specific S a CFR that governs um, cosmetics and sets the standards. So they had an obligation to warn if, if it may cause health issues in individuals and they fail to do so. Um, there are a number of consumer claims, and I'm talking really primarily about the personal injury claims at this time. Um, as you're aware, a number of class claims have also been filed uh, by, by Jennifer at Alstock and some others have also filed class claims. Um, and those are the bucket of claims that we have right now. And we imagine there are many more coming down the coming down the pipeline. Yeah. and. Um... We know that all sorts of products, I mean, I think about it every morning when I, well, on the mornings when I do get ready uh, to go yeah, anywhere, working right. from home has its other classes, but, um, you know, I think about there's all these products and over time we learn this one's bad, that one's bad. And so with hair relaxer, uh, you know, is this a, a situation where the companies, so L'Oreal and the other makeup companies knew and just didn't warn consumers or tried to cover it up? Um, do we know enough about that yet? Well, those are exactly our allegations. Um, so aware, they have to be aware. You have to know what you're putting in your product that you're selling for human use, and human consumption. Um, and so they knowingly, you know, created this toxic mix, right? These, these hair relaxer products, um, that are that lead to uterine or ovarian cancer in individuals and fail to warn, fail to say, hey, there is an increased risk that you'll develop ovarian and uterine cancer and make your own decisions, right? And we're familiar with that uh, in in the medical device context and in and also in the drug context. Um, and so that's that's really at the core of it. Um, what they knew, when they knew it, and their failure 
to identify those problematic chemicals to the public and let those women know that they were at an increased risk for these cancers. Do you have any idea how many um, individual plaintiffs there might be out there? Wow, the river, you want to take that one? Thousands. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> Uh, a lot. I mean, you know, the, the population, we, uh, I guess we, we won't know until we know uh, how many plaintiffs we're going to represent. But what we can say is that, uh, you know, I, I challenge you to go to a random store, grocery store, and uh, ask uh, every black woman you see, have you ever had a hair relaxer? And, and I would probably venture to say that almost all of them um, have had it at some point in time in their life, at least a large percentage, right, have experienced it. So, you know, so when we look at the population of potential individuals or for, for women that have been exposed to the chemical, that number is going to be um, extremely high. Um, and so then when we begin to look at um, the, the the number who have uterine or, or ovarian cancer, again, you know, we don't know what that number is going to be, but we, we believe that that number is going to be high and potentially higher than some other mass torts litigations that we've seen in the past. Yeah, uh, it's it's really unbelievable, um, you know, to, to watch this unfold. And and um, I'm sure we'll hear lots of stories, individual stories and, and uh, you know, Liberty yours could have been one of them, right? I mean, this is something that was just part of, uh, you know, how you grew up and, and many others as well. And, and unbeknownst to everyone, this was just like bathing in in, chem in toxic chemicals. Um, it, it's just such a tragedy, but, uh, you know, to, to flip it, because I don't want to end on a, on a sour note, uh, you know, certainly uh, plaintiff lawyers and plaintiffs alike are all so very lucky to have the two of you and others at the helm and in leadership, uh, taking a place at the table and making sure that you know everyone's uh, individual uh, story is kept intact, and you know really fighting hard for for justice, which, as you've both said, is just what's fair. Um, any last thoughts before we sign off for the day? Um, I, you know, I'll just say that uh, there, there there's no champion of of causes that I'd rather be. Uh, fighting with uh, for my community than than Fu Zimmerman uh, and the rest of the team that we have. I think that we have um, an amazing slate of lawyers um, that are, that are all have really come together um, for the common good, which which is when you get a lot of super smart uh, uh, lawyers in the room. Sometimes it's hard for them to play well together in the sandbox. Um, but I think that the the leadership that we have now has really um, focused us that the sandbox is one that is not about us, but is about the folks that we get a chance to represent. And, um, you know, I really look forward to to, to, to being a part of the team that's going to hold this industry accountable uh, for not only what they did in their products and what they didn't say about their products, but, you know, also for them, you know, the marketing tactics that they had towards um, towards the Black community. And so, um, you, know, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, 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 to share um, you know, what we're doing and what's going on. And, and always, I'm always excited to have an opportunity to be with Fu at any point in time. And so um, we're looking forward to the litigation and we're looking forward to, to the fight. And I'll echo La Ruby. It's, it's really an extraordinary um, group of firms. I mean, absolutely um, super honored as usual to work with La Ruby, uh, my co-lead counsel, you know, Michael London, Fidelma Fitzpatrick, Ben Crump, um, just really uh, decades and decades of experience. Our PC is uh, bar none, you know, extraordinary. And, you know, please take a look at it for everybody to see who's on there. You know, Brian Barr at Levin Pap. I'm going to miss someone. That's why I don't want to do this. Kelly, who runs the San Francisco office for Leaf Cabrasier, you know, Nathan at Beasley and, and Larry Taylor at the Cochran firm and Tim Becker. I'm sitting in his office right now. You know, LaRuby's leading on PC. Uh, Renee Rocha from Morgan and Morgan. I know I'm going to miss someone and get in trouble, but you know, from the co-leads to the PEC to a robust PSC. You know, I, I know Michael Watts is on there. Well, Jane Conroy is on our PC. My God, if I forgot her, that'd be horrible. But we know tried many of the opioid cases. Um, so th this is Thank really you, um, extraordinary amount of talent uh, experience in the biggest cases in the country. 
diverse. Um, I think we're both very proud of the law firms that we're standing with on behalf of, you know, thousands of women and children who've been exposed to this. So I'm, I'm really honored to work with everybody, to learn from everybody. It's a long haul um, and we're prepared for the fight, but we don't take it for granted. And we have a really um, collaborative situation going on amongst all the firms. Uh, as the co-leads, we respect all the firms. We plan to work with everyone, not to just decide what work is done and, and lead the litigation in our own terms, but to really rely on the tremendous expertise of the entire leadership structure. And hopefully, uh, you know, right, right moves, right day, good luck. Uh, we'll be able to get some justice for these women. Well, I, I, there's no one I'd rather see running this, uh, running this show than the two of you. Thank you both for sitting down with me. It's been such a privilege and honor. And I hope we can chat again um, as you move along in this litigation. Uh, Mass Tort News is really proud uh, to be uh, you know, a, a supporter of Shades of Mass and everything that you do. So to the both of you and your firms, thank you so, so much. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Right, thanks.